David, you're on. I'm on. All right. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for coming tonight. Uh, for those of you who I have not met before, my name is David Knowles. I'm the creative director and uh, book designer for Domain, which is a uh, publisher currently based in upstate New York, mostly based in New York City. And uh, we uh, create collaborative book works with various artists and writers, offering a, a queer perspective on uh, topics as diverse as nightlife, design, literature. And uh, tonight we're celebrating the launch of our latest publication, a very special book called The Drag Explosion by Linda Simpson, who is joining us here. <laughs> And before we get started, um, I do want to acknowledge and thank everybody who has placed an order already for the drag explosion. And thank you for your incredible patience with the delivery of the book, uh, which has finally made its way to New York City via rowboat from our printer in Poland. Um, and barring any further weather related or public health emergencies, uh, we expect to fulfill all of the orders for the book in the next week. So uh, to celebrate the arrival of this book stateside, uh, I'm pleased to introduce our two guests for the evening, both of whom have played an instrumental role in the realization of this publication. Uh, we have first with us Linda Simpson, uh, who is an author and the photographer behind the drag explosion. Uh, the photos of her formative drag years have been featured in books, magazines, art exhibits, and documentaries, as well as her own touring slideshow. Her books include Pages, released by Paradam in 2013, The Drag Explosion, published by Domain this year, and most recently, uh, a new book I hear, Linda, Malibu Mondays, published by Facademy in 2021. She has worked as a nightlife promoter, journalist, playwright, actress, and game show hostess. Thank you, Linda, for everything you've done so far, and thanks for being with us tonight. Thank you, David, very much. I thank you. My God, you did all the work with the book. Um, and, um, and David, thank you for that kind intro. Yeah, of course. Um, we also have joining us this evening uh, a contributor to the drag explosion, Tavi Nyong'o. Uh, he wrote the afterword for the book uh, and writes about art and performance through the lenses of blackness and queerness in both popular and academic venues. Uh, he is the chair and professor of theater and performance studies at Yale. And his books include The Amalgamation Waltz, Race, Performance, and the Ruses of Memory from 2009. And most recently, Afrofabulations, the queer drama of black life from 2019. So thank you, Tavia, for being with us this evening as well. And thank, thank you, you for your, your contribution to uh, the publication. Exciting. So Thanks. Um, so it's hard to believe since we've been working on this project almost a year now, I think, or it's been in the works for almost a year, but this is actually the first time that all three of us have ever seen each other, I think, uh, which is sort of remarkable given, given how far we've come. But um, it means that we're all familiar with the material from the book in really different ways. Linda, obviously you created most of it. Uh, Tavia, you have some kind of connection or direct connection with uh, a lot of the faces and, and places in the publication. Uh, and I feel like I came to it almost as uh, sort of an outsider or a stranger in a way, uh, but was drawn to it nonetheless by some some kind of shared energy or shared force. And um, I think part of the reason uh, why I was able to cull this archive of almost 700 images down to, uh, to what we have in the book is because I had this little bit of distance from everything. And I first learned about Linda's work uh, from seeing the slideshow presentation of the drag explosion uh, and seeing her give this presentation a couple of times. Um, so I was familiar with the narrative that Linda uh, told around her photography and the way that the images were, were knitted together. Um, and I think that what I'd like to do today and what we've kind of set up here today is 
something like a, a re, rewriting or a different uh, version of the drag explosion slideshow. And what I'd like to do is show uh, a couple of images and Tavia, I know that you have suggested um, a few and, and I've thrown a few in to, to fill the gaps, but I'd like to take us through the book essentially chapter by chapter and uh, look at look at a couple of images and, and get our reactions to them. And Linda, you can tell us the tell us the story of the drag explosion through uh, through our selections and and uh, and that's what we'll do. So I'll share my screen here and um, David, you want to share your screen? I think I have to make you the host. All right. So I'm going. I'm making you the host right now. And now you should be able to do it. Love hosting duties. Okay, let's see what we have here. Well, first of all, I have to uh, sell the book a little bit, right? And give a little plug up front, but this is the drag explosion. Linda, <laughs> Linda has a copy, Tavia has a copy. I have a copy. We might be the only people in the world that have copies right now, um, but soon all of you will have copies. So uh, I guess, Linda, maybe you can narrate for us the beginning of your experience with drag and how you first uh, first entered into this world. Well, this photo that you're showing um, is I think from 87. Mm -hmm. And, and um, it's at the gay parade. And that is about the time that I started doing drag um, I was not, I, I was really fascinated by the East Village drag scene that was going pretty strong at that point. And so I um, decided to eventually join. Um, this um, picture um, was of a float that I helped organize. And I actually, like I said, hadn't started doing drag yet. So that was kind of like a big deal for me to sort of like, you know, get involved in a scene that really spoke to me. I, I didn't realize actually that I wanted to do drag even at that point, but certainly um, um, this person who you're showing right now, Taboo was instrumental in me getting involved with the scene. Taboo was already like a big star at the Pyramid Club and an artist and, um, and then became a friend. And, was sort of my guide into entering the scene. I mean, I became friends with, uh, you know, other people also in the East Village, but I think Taboo was like the most influential. And in my book, I say that. <laughs> and um, and these photos are from the book also, of course. And this, oh, this photo is actually from 80, I can't remember all the dates, 88? This one, Tavia, you picked this one out, right? Um, yes, well, I picked it out as from it's a Wigstock image, right? And it's on uh, it, it's 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 on a spread with a, another photo of an ACT UP demonstration, and they both have the pink triangle. So right, uh, kind of, yeah, there you go. I don't know if they're the same year, but they're they're in the same spread. Yeah. Um, well, the one from Wigstock was when Wigstock, uh, you know, the annual drag event was still at Tompkins Square Park. And um, these guys who I all know, Adam and uh, Matt in the middle and George, were all very involved with um, ACT UP at the time. And um, as you can tell by George's t-shirt and the sticker on Adam's t-shirt. And, um, you know, that was uh, very uh, prevalent back then because, um, you know, it was the, the, high, uh, the you know, peak moments of the AIDS crisis and, um, Thank God, you know, for stuff like ACT UP and other organizations that were, you know, fighting back and we're putting some spirit back into or putting some spirit into like a resistance um, to what was going on. And so, you know, the t so the picture, you know, was fun. I mean, they're dressing in drag, but of course it's reflective of, you know, a very um, serious and often dark time. And this one was that. This was a. This was. Um, I can't remember. It was ACT UP sponsored, but it was a. It was a media. Uh, um, a protest down at City Hall, and I think it was the protest was just because you know no government institution, including New York City, was doing much to help combat AIDS, 
And um, if you'll notice, the person on the very, very left is cut off, but that's Keith Haring. And um, some of the other people immediately behind him were um, friends of his that had also come to the, to the protest. Tavi, were you living in, uh, were you in New York City at this time? I first came, no, I was, I, I moved to the city in uh, 1995 after college. So, but I was certainly following um, what was happening in um, ACT UP and um, I think occasionally coming down to the city for, um, well, actually the AIDS dance that was sort of like our trip down. Oh yeah. Jacket, right. <laughs> um, where there was a one, one time, uh, Madonna sighting. I can't remember which year that was. But that oh my God, I was there at that one. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> Where was that? I can't remember. Um, somewhere on the West Side. I can't remember. It was a yeah. huge club. It was a very weird West Side club. And Madonna came out and said, Thanks for coming. And then she left. <laughs> yeah, I was so curious, Tavia, because you wrote in um you wrote in your uh afterward for the drag explosion about encountering Linda's work. Um from a young age in Connecticut. And I was just, I didn't realize, Linda, I know you worked on My Comrade, um, which, you know, speaking of this, here's a couple, we have some images here from the from the publication, but uh, Tommy, you said you got issues of My Comrade in Connecticut. And and I was, I didn't realize that something that was, you know, seeing these like staple bound publications that something like that would have a reach beyond New York City even. I like always imagined this as of like, very localized uh, publication or localized endeavor. Yeah, just to interject, that my comrade was a magazine I used to publish. It was an underground gay magazine. And that's why we wanted it. Um, I was been texting with friends from, I was in Connecticut in college. I was at Wesleyan and uh, from 91 to 95 and um, we, um, I was texting today to try to figure out which friend brought copies of my comrade to, um, to campus, but uh, we think it was my friend Ben. And um, it was, you know, I mean, Connecticut is just one state away, whatever. So <laughs> we definitely were part of the kind of queer activist party scene. And, you know, Wesleyan is a big, you know, Big queer activist party campus. So I guess you know if there was going to be a place, you know, where the Sami Stat of my com my comrade was going to show up, um, it was going to be there for sure. Yeah, zine culture was in full effect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, thank your friend Ben for me. <laughs> I thought that this image was when I first saw this. Uh, uh, I guess it's uh, Dari Johnson. A Danny is how she Danny pronounces Johnson. her name. Right. Yeah. I thought. I, I thought. I thought. It, I thought it was Lady Miss Keir. Uh, sure. Well, they had a similar aesthetic and yeah. kind of a similar look too, but um, but Danny, as you'll notice, is posing with a machine gun. <laughs> yeah. And um, of course, um, the gun imagery that we were using in My Comrade was to show this kind of like tongue in cheek, you know, gay militancy. And so there's a lot of pictures actually of people with guns. There's Taboo. Um, this is um, the cover of the first issue, right? Yeah. Well, the cover was in black and white. It was a different photo, but but yes, that was taken at the photo session. And and Taboo is I'm um, holding a machine gun, a la Patty Hearst, um, who was um, in her Symbo Symbionese Liberation Army terrorist I wanted, days. Could I? I wanted to ask you, Linda, a question because I don't know if this is in the slideshow, but there's this amazing image of. Um, I believe it's the inside of your East Village apartment with the mm -hmm. Henry Connell installation. Yeah. Um, yeah, there it is. Oh, oh. Mm -hmm. is that the next image? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, th th this is so amazing. Just, you know, like that you were living with Oh My Comrade, like. Well, yeah, I was really committed. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I think this, we painted it, I think I was having a party, a release party for the magazine. And so, you know, my apartment was pretty um, tenement. So I didn't really care about painting it so much. Um, you know, just another, you know, thing to do to mess up the apartment. Um, but, but yeah, no, I was very, um, um, my comment was sort of like my artistic response 
to uh, the AIDS crisis and all the homophobia that was going on. And so I just, um, you know, um, this art installation, I guess, or, or this painting in my apartment just kind of reflected that. I didn't even think of it as an art installation, actually. I just thought of it as decor for the party, but certainly it has that, you know, kind of arty effect too. And um, you want me to talk about this one? This photo was at the pyramid. <laughs> we're gonna make a we're gonna make a dramatic transition here. <laughs> ah, this photo was at the pyramid club, and um, Dimitri, who's the name of the go-go dancer, was on the bar, and um, that's actually RuPaul tipping Dimitri, and um, I and. Um, that was um, where I was doing parties at the time in the very early 90s. The, the pyramid had been kind of like the um, headquarters of like, you know, the goofy, kooky, um, new wave of drag in the 80s. And then I started like at the very beginning of the 90s. And the pyramid by that time was a little bit in decline, but, man, but you know, me and other people helped revive it. And that included, of course, having Gogo dancers. And um, and then RuPaul was just, you know, part of the crowd at that point. You know, I mean, she was, a, 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 you know, a drag queen of some note on the downtown scene. But she was, you know, more one of the gang. Hey, David, I think there's a way of, like, putting all three of us on the screen as the slides go on, too. I think if you, I think if you spotlight, I'm not sure. Oh, well, maybe not. Oh, okay, I might be confused. And it was perfectly fine as it was too. <laughs> Linda, I thought you were supposed to be the uh, the, the Zoom queen. Obviously not, <laughs> right? Yeah, I'm just letting in a few people from the waiting room. Okay. Don't wanna keep anyone waiting outside here. Okay, got everyone, yes, great. And um, well, if you're just joining us, this is a photo by me, Linda Simpson, from the Drag Explosion, the new photo book. And this particular photo was, um, I don't remember the year, but it was very early in the 90s. I was at the Pyramid Club. And it's RuPaul tipping Dimitri, who was a go-go boy, who I'm still friends with. Is Dimitri here tonight? No, Dimitri lives in uh, Panama. Oh, wow, that's glamorous. Um, Talia, you selected this one too, which I was really happy about. I I was perhaps most, as I was laying this book out and you'll see in the coming pages, but I was perhaps most inspired by the, um, uh, the images from the Pyramid Club, um, just because of uh, seeing enough shots and then feeling like I had a, a real mental map of the space in my head and seeing images taken in the same places over and over again. Um, but this is this, uh, this staircase that you talk about, Linda, as being uh, super perilous in high heels uh, and then the entryway to the dressing room, right? Well, yes. I mean, uh, the drag queen in the picture is Aphrodite. And you can kind of see um, on the right side, a staircase and the dressing room um, for the pyramid was located in the basement. And it was actually great. It was really spacious. I mean, it was run down, but it was very spacious with, you know, mirrors and enough room to get ready. And then you would go up, a, 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 it was practically, it was a ladder really to get to be, to get um, to behind this uh, stage area and then you could enter without having to go through the crowd. So it was great in that respect, but, it, but it, I, I could never do that now at this age. But back then, you know, we were like running up and down those stairs, no matter what we were wearing. And um, Aphrodite, I'm still friends with too. She's actually, we're both from Minnesota, although I didn't meet her until she moved to New York. And, um, and uh, we're still friends. I picked this, well, I was interested in this photo because um, it um, the look that she's serving, um, if I'm not mistaken, is a 
Whitney Houston circa Queen of the Night look. Um, and um, I, um, I guess I kind of wanted to know, Linda, about the, um, you know, the sort of role of like homage drag mm -hmm. at the pyramid, like to what degree, which is often I think associated with a certain kind of classic drag, right? Where you're, mm -hmm. you're putting on, you know, whoever, like Diane Carroll, or in this case, I mean, Whitney was then a, um, uh, then at the height of her fame, right? But right. also, um, you know, uh, very much not only a queer icon, but also like a queer woman, right? And like, to what degree was that, you know, part of the understanding at that time? Well, you know, um, the, um, I, you know, we were really plugged into pop culture. Yeah. So I don't even know, honestly. I mean, I didn't really un get the Whitney reference until you mentioned it. Um, I mean, because Aphrodite just had a really pretty face, but you're right. She looks a lot like Whitney Houston. Um, but I don't, I think that it was kind of rare at that time to do just sort of like straight impersonations you know, that was looked at as almost kind of a little, or, or it was not in a part of our world that much. Like for someone to go up and just do like a Whitney Houston impersonation or a, mm -hmm. you know, Aretha Franklin impersonation or, a you know, Barbara Streisand impersonation, I think would have been looked upon as being a little mm, square or a little boring. But people, if they did it, would do it tongue in cheek, mm -hmm. you know? And of course, there were like fierce house songs that were going on right now that people would um, lip sync to. But then I don't think it was as much trying to um, impersonate the person as it was just to try to get the energy going. And, and these are more photos from the, um, the pyramid dressing room. The pyramid was, at that point too was used by like a lot of bands. So there was, they, and they really were rough on the club. So that's why there was a lot of graffiti and kind of like a rundown atmosphere of the dressing room also. And the people on the left are Miss Guy and Le uh, Michael T and uh, Jojo Americo. And they were part of a, um, I can't remember. They did a show that night. And then on the right is RuPaul. Um, and she had put up a curtain because she wanted a little privacy for changing. <laughs> this is kind of what I was speaking about earlier when I was talking about, you know, all of these photos taken in the same place, but obviously, you know, maybe taken on the same night, maybe, maybe taken years apart. You can see like in the background of the photo on the left, there's a piece of newspaper that's covering up this heating, this like air duct that's visible oh. on the right. And somebody's painted the, uh, you know, the beam pink on the left and it's white on the right. So it's just, I mean, it's really curious to me because obviously the same, uh, you know, the same graffiti is there and everything. But uh, in looking at all of these images, there's a real like claustrophobia to all of, to everything. Cause you know, there's really only three angles that you can see uh, all of these pictures at. And then this one chair that gets a lot of use uh, in the basement. <laughs> Yes, David. Now, if you're again, if you're just joining us, David, who was just talking, is the publisher and the designer of the book, and I think you did such a great job, David, of juxtaposing the photos, oh, including these this trio, and um, on top, uh, this is a, this is you know again all from the Pyramid Club um, dressing room, and I, I guess it was like an old chair. <laughs> <laughs> so, probably someone dragged it off the street and um, set it down there. And then Liz and Paige are in the upper left-hand corner and coffee is in the green. And then Paige again, um, she had just um, castrated her plastic penis on stage. And that's why her, her skirt I have, yeah, is I have bloody. to say of all of the, of all of the, characters and the figures in this book page is definitely one that stands out and was indeed the subject of your 2013 book your previous photo book um, yeah and yeah it's just really one of those people that jumps out from the pages from and it's continuous through all of these through all of the chapters and through all of the well yeah and I think one of the reasons too as you can tell she was gorgeous you know what I mean and so you know, it's like a modeling agency, the supermodels, you know what I mean, yeah. tend to stand out. Yeah. I mean, everyone was beautiful in their own way, of course. 
We're making another uh, bit of a leap here from chapter to chapter. So the, the chapter that we were just talking about focused on your time at the Pyramid Club and, and uh, the kind of the political agitprop orientation, let's say, of, of My Comrade magazine, which you published. Um, there was a point at which you started working more as a, um, a nightlife promoter and working in larger scale clubs. Is that right? Yeah, it is. But but besides that, I mean, I expanded beyond my like East Village, um, right. um, you know, comfort, comfort zone. But besides that, I just enjoyed going out. So mm -hmm. I was out a lot at the clubs. And this picture is from the Limelight, which was the headquarters of the club kids scene. And I wasn't a club kid, but I did like enjoy, you know, the the whole hubbubaloo that went on in that world, including, you know, great costuming and great looks. This is Kabuki on the left and then Kide on the right. And it was just very um, dazzling to, um, you know, see all these people that had, you know, committed themselves so much to the nightlife. And again, like cameras weren't that popular. So people were doing it to impress one another as opposed to just having their photo taken all night. Right. And, and, and this is Francine on top of Thaddeus. And this was at the Copacabana when it was over on 60th Street. I actually did want to ask specifically about photography because um, the status or the activity of photography in nightlife and in clubs has changed a lot, even since I've been going out, like my... I would say by the time I, you know, reached the age where it was like appropriate for me to be like going to clubs, like photography was very, very in. And this is like, you know, we're talking like Miss Shapes era, like partying in New York, where it's like the whole point is to go out and get your picture taken. And obviously none of us are going out at all anymore, but for the time being, but um, prior to uh, our current situation, the vibe inside of the clubs and the venues that I would go to was very strictly no photography and very like, anti-image making like you're there for the the pure unmediated uh experience and it sounds like that was um kind of the case in the time that you were making these photos but not necessarily because you know people were anti-photography but just because it didn't occur to people to go out and bring a camera with them in the same way or yeah. cameras weren't as ubiquitous let's say right part of it too you did have to like actually a lot of times cameras were scorned especially at gay bars, because, you know, it just wasn't proper etiquette because people were in the closet um, or, you know, being having your photo taken to gay bar, you know, could be bad for your reputation. So, mm -hmm. so I, and at the clubs too, sometimes, um, uh, you know, camera usage was looked down upon, but I mostly just took pictures of friends. You know, very few of my photos were like paparazzi. So, um, so I was sort of, you know, I think conscious of being um, respectful of people's boundaries. And, um, but, but, um, but uh, yeah, I, I wish I had taken more photos, honestly. And, and this photo is, um, what, this was at the Palladium Club and that's Kevin Aviance. And Kevin was um, a big performer um, at the time, but also a participant in the club scene. She had a lot of like chart topping dance songs. And Kevin's look was more gender fuck, you know, which was um, interesting because a lot of the drag queens, I think back then wanted to look very girly. And um, Kevin was more about not, you know, necessarily wearing breasts or even a wig and, um, but, you know, being very um, flamboyant and costume oriented. Kavi, I see the picture uh, behind you. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't sure if I was on screen or not. Yeah, there you go. This is- I'm glad, I'm glad that made it. This I'm... was- um... This was uh, one of the gifts to Tavia for his, uh, his writing of the afterward is this uh, photo of Kevin, which I really, which I really love as well. Can, um, can you see Tavia right now at this very moment or you noticed before? Well, I saw before, but I didn't, uh, I, right. didn't see you. I didn't say. Anything. Okay, later on we'll have to spotlight Tavia so we can see it. <laughs> I will just, yeah, I, I this, this, this is such an image that's, um, sorry, my Battery is about to die. Hang on, but um, when David invited me to write um, for the book, 
um, he, uh, he sent me this photo and I knew that I, <laughs> that's what <laughs> seduced me. Those seductive eyes of, you know, Kevin, who I saw, you know, perform most, mo many times and um, uh, also um, dance to, you know, his music many times. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah, exactly. I'm curious. Um, what was your uh, what was your party life like in in New York in the in the '90s when you moved down? Were you were you at the Palladium and the Limelight and these other these other haunts? Uh, me, yeah, no, I definitely um, went to the Limelight. Um, I may or may not have met a boyfriend of mine in the dark room of the limelight. <laughs> um, the tunnel pyramid, the warehouse in the Bronx, but also I think it was in Times Square for a while. Um, Esqualita, uh, Palladium, um, for sure. Um, yeah, I mean, that was the sort of peak. Uh, yeah my proclivities to, you know, and also when, yeah, like it's, I, I, I unfortunately, um, you know, moved to New York right when, right at the height of, um, you know, Giuliani's clampdown on nightlife, right? So I kind of sort of witnessed that, but I was, I had a couple of years, you know, um, and actually I actually worked in nightlife. Um, I, my first job, after college was uh, working for a nightclub, a nightlife promoter. I was Mark Burke, please. Um, uh, I, I worked, I worked in his office. Oh my God. Yeah. Mark was the biggest gay party thrower at that point. Yeah. That was a very weird sort of like, yeah. Like the big Chelsea queen experience. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. I, um, I did notice also only today, in fact, that, I think this is the same photo booth as the Kevin Avion. It is. Photo. Yeah, the photo booth that Kevin Avion was yeah. posing in at the Palladium. Um, and these are actually two people that I was familiar with before I even started working on the design of this book because I'd seen um, Lena, who's the figure on the left, right? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, DJ in Fire Island yeah. previously. Yeah, um, Lena, whose name at that point was Gerlina, and um, Candace came were like the big it girls of the of the nightlife scene, and um, they were um, very leggy, each of them. And this photo, I think, shows it. And they would wear extremely high heels and do runway um, modeling, dancing on the dance floor, and it was incredible. It was hypnotic. And that's Lady Bunny. Bunny is very very happy with this photo because <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure well she should be it's a great photo and, it is it is and this is at Webster Hall and I think Bunny was hosting a party I don't know um but but anyway she spontaneously got down on the couch which just happened to have this um animal print um throw and um I took a photo and the rest is, you know, documentary and history. I did notice there is a lot of recurring leopard print in uh, the Drag Explosion book. I oh, was, is there? It oh. does, it, it pops up in a few places. And I like this photo because it's kind of like, you know, this is the, uh, this is finally getting home from the club, right? So yeah. I yeah, as I remember it, my friend Lola and I were going home. I think we were coming from an after hours club. And so this is Dawn. And um, I, you know, she was continuing on the trip, but they were dropping me off in front of my apartment building. Um, I know that uh, there was a, a, a period in the drag explosion and a, a role that um, television and being on TV played in the popularization of drag. Uh, and I picked out this photo because I think you were out shooting a cable TV series, right? Like a public access TV series in this image. Yeah, that's that's me on the left. And then Glenda Orgasm is on the right. And Glenda had a TV show, um, a public access TV show. And it was called, what was it called? Glenda Orgasm Show, I think. And <laughs> um, But Glenda would go out and um, interview people. She, she did a lot of that kind of thematic stuff. Mm -hmm. And would go. Uh, she she walked. She hung out with Kamala, uh, 
Camelia Pagliat, they were friends and, you know, they went on tours and, uh, and other various things. So Glenda was kind of like smart in her drag. And I think we were just kind of like, you know, um, focusing on the popularity of drag too. But we were in a tour bus as part of her um, filming. We actually were stuck in traffic at this point on Lower Broadway. This is my favorite thing to do um, on the day after I spend a night at the club too, is to go on an open top tour bus of, around New York. <laughs> <laughs> it's perfect, but it wasn't just uh, obviously cable access TV. There was some wider. Uh... Well, drag became very popular in the nineties as a trend mm -hmm. and RuPaul, RuPaul's success um, stimulated all this. And so all of a sudden TV talk shows, including you know, the one pictured on the left, wanted drag queens because, you know, we were made for good television because we were new and unfamiliar to the public and like, you know, somewhat scandalous. And um, and that's Bunny and me and Head of Lettuce um, on a show called Real Sex. And um, and then the, 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 the photo on the right is um, Arsenio Hall had the hot, um, you know, fresh talk show at that time, the late night talk show. And RuPaul went on as a guest after she became a pop star. And that was really a big deal because it was not very, you know, it wasn't even thought of to have like a drag queen on as a guest. And so it was a kind of really big breakthrough. So I took that picture um, from my, I mean, on my television screen in my apartment. And, and that's Ru again, RuPaul. Yeah. And she's with Willie Ninja, the very famous Voguer. And that was at the, mm, the coffee shop restaurant, which was um, right next to Union Square because Wigstock was going on that year. This is 1991. And they were both um, going to perform later. I don't even think they knew each other that well, but they just happened to be sitting together. And I was at the table too. United over their love of fruit salad. It was yeah, made. exactly. <laughs> yeah, delicious fruit cup. <laughs> Good. Perfect pre-performance snack. Um, I know you just mentioned Wigstock, and I know this is an image from the first one. Right? I, I don't think it's the first, but it was one of the Another first. One. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, this was, again, when Wigstock was still in Tompkins Square Park. There used to be a band shell in the park that was permanent, and it was crumbling and falling apart, just like the whole park was or uh, the whole East Village was. And um, that's Bunny um, hosting. She, you know, was the hostess um, right from the beginning. And she pretty much, you know, took over curating as mm. um, the events went by. There's band equipment in the background because there were a lot more bands at that point too that were involved with uh, early wig stocks. This one is, um, this one's a Tavia Select, right? Yeah, this is uh, Lee Bowery, right? In 93, 93 Wigstock? Oh, I think you're right. Yeah, I think it was 93. Yep, it was behind stage. And you saw the performance, Tavia? I did, yeah. Uh, Please describe said. to the audience what it was. Um, this was my first time, maybe my only time seeing Lee Bowery in performance. Um, and, um, uh, you know, he came on stage and did this incredible Lee Bowery act that culminated with him giving birth to another <laughs> performer who was crouched between his legs. Um, that just- It was a complete shock a -roo. It was, yeah, it was, it was, it was, yeah, it was completely shock a yeah. That person isn't like inside of this outfit right now in this picture, are they? Mm -hmm. I don't think, no. Okay. No. <laughs> She was wearing a different outfit when she came on stage. And um, and Lee Barry, um, who was Australian, actually lived in London. And so Lee would come over to New York once in a while and always cause like some big scene by racing around to the clubs. And then I, I think this is the I think this was the only time I saw her perform also. Um, um, but uh, but she but I certainly had seen um, Lee at the clubs. And I think in the book, I mean, I know in the book, there's another photo of Lee too. There's one, yeah, this is Wigstock at the piers, correct? This is when Wigstock got big and so it bigger than it, you know the parks could accommodate. So it moved over to the West Side piers. And this was behind stage. This is 
comedian, Barbara Patterson Lloyd. And her look was always um, very suburban on purpose. And um, um, as you can see, the, you know, the, the, the West Side wasn't as manicured as it is now. Uh, this one. I love this picture. Uh, that's another photo from Wigstock. And Misunderstood is on the left. And um, Coco was the name of the person on the right. And she's kind of disappeared. She, no one knows her whereabouts from what I can understand. But Misunderstood had a, you know, um, an incredibly over the top drag look while Coco was giving realness. So it's kind of an interesting contrast. And this is Paige again. I'm just kind of surprised you picked this photo. Um, David mentioned this earlier, but David, I really gave David what I thought was kind of like the best of my photos, which was a lot. It was a lot of photos. And then David narrowed it down to the, you know, the 200, how many photos are in the book? 225 or something? Um, something like, no, there's like, there's like 400 of them in there. Okay, I should four, do an there's actual 400 in the, there's 400 photos in the book? Yeah, there's there's quite a few. Oh, I didn't realize there were that many. Are you sure, David? <laughs> there's like 250 pages, and there's uh, oh, oh, maybe there's like 300. All right. Well, anyways, David narrowed it down, and that was that was um, um, a good idea because it was easier for me to have like um, somebody else do it rather than me like, you know, drive myself crazy over which photos I wanted to include. And then David and I had back and forth, of course, about some of the photos. I suggested some that maybe he didn't pick um, initially. And then, but I was kind of surprised you chose that one because I just thought it was like kind of an undeveloped photo. But 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 I do love it. I'm glad you, you know, selected it. I like it. this one, and I, I like all of the images of of Paige really. And um, I mean, this is a photo that appears in the final chapter of the book, which uh, really takes on a a more mournful tone, I think, because it's about the end both of um, both of the drag explosion as like a cultural phenomenon, and then also the end of um, of many like individuals' lives. Uh, because of AIDS. So it's a it's a sad note to end on, but there is hopeful elements, I think. And uh, and yeah, I just think that this one in particular really, I mean, this one really spoke to me, so. Mm -hmm. And this book, my, my, David mentioned earlier, I have another book called Pages and it's all solo shots of Page, but this one isn't even in that book. In terms of uh, uh, images that, that speak, you know, like the one that spoke to me is the one you just just showed, right, of um, Misunderstood and Coco, because this is, you know, I mean, when I saw it, it struck me as an image that was, you know, I mean, to me, this could have been taken like in 2020, right? Like there's a certain kind of timeless, like return, yeah. certain kind of elements in, um, uh, you know, in, uh, in, in drag and, um, uh, mm. it, it, it's just, it was nice for me to kind of counterbalance. Yeah. That kind of like, sort of like mournful elegiac tone towards mm. the end of the book with the sense that I think Linda, you also bring, and you kind of say like, this book is a gift to like the younger Queens to kind of like, I don't know, <laughs> like, take a look, you know, <laughs> like reinvent, you know, and, and, and see that they're, they're in this, um, you know, in this like beautiful historical pageant, you know, which with this image, you know, to me. Yeah, there's a lineage, definitely. Um, I, I think that Misunderstood's um, makeup in this picture is actually, I mean, at the time when she was doing it, that was a little more unusual. And um, Coco's more naturalistic look was mm -hmm. more popular even among drag queens. 
And, you know, now makeup has really evolved in the drag scene. The, back then, I think, like, it, the point was to look more girly. And now the point is to look more like a drag queen. And, like, you know, really have all these um, elements, you know. It's like a checklist, you know, the eyebrows, the cheekbones, the contouring, etc. So in a way, I mean, you know, we're all more sentimental about our own generation. But I kind of think that there was a that the because the makeup was a little bit lighter back then, you could read expressions a little more. I, I, I think there's a numbing of expressions now because everyone's so, you know, kabuki like not kabuki the drag queen, but you know, kabuki the the masking. This also appears at the, the end of the book. Um, I know Keith made an appearance in the beginning uh, at the ACT UP rally, but this is a later shot, right? Yeah, both of those guys are named Keith, actually, and both of them died of AIDS. And of course, Keith Herring on the right was very famous. Um, and um, I took that photo. I mean, it was kind of crass. I took it at Andy Warhol's memorial service at St. Patrick's, but um, I don't think he minded, but you know, I probably was, that was a, you know, sort of a paparazzi shot, but it's a sad photo, of course, because it was a, I think, you know, Warhol meant a lot to him and, um, and, you know, there was a lot of death going on yeah. at that time. I mean, it's like, it's, it was interesting to like finish the book on this note, because I do feel like there's a kind of, I mean, we were working on this in a year when there was just like a lot of death around everywhere and where the kind of like culture that we were exploring in this in this publication is really just um is itself dormant in a way um so it's kind of the the feeling of of completing this chapter in particular um there was something uh there was some kind of like strange uh strange vibrancy and strange vibe to it um and this was the, actually the final, this is the final image for the book that we selected. And this is Mona Foote who passed away recently. Yeah, my, Mona Foote who was, uh, who I knew from the pyramid mostly, uh, but, but Nisham and I, uh, that Mona's real name was Nisham. Nisham and I had um, stayed in each other's lives ever since. So it was very shocking when um, Mona died last year of COVID of all things. And, um, but this was her most famous look, I think, was the, the, the Wonder Woman um, get up. This was at Wigstock West. One year they did Wigstock in San Francisco and it was in this big mm, hall of some sort. There's, um, there's one more queen who's not in the book. <laughs> 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 this is Tavia. <laughs> oh my god. Tavia turns completely red and runs out of the room. <laughs> but <laughs> where was where was this taken? <laughs> um this was taken at the Queer Alliance uh party. Um it, David asked me if I ever did drag, and I was like, well, yeah, I actually did drag. I was Octavia in college. Uh my drag mother was uh Tristan Terramino, who went on to become a big uh, lesbian sex expert. Oh yeah. Um, so um, so Tristan did that makeup, and uh, that's my friend Matt, who was my date uh, for what else? You know, uh, the Emerald City themed um, queer queer alliance party. Oh my god, what a riot, huh? Well, I, I think those those the the um, the uh, the boots, the combat boots, are like kind of an homage to the sort of my comrade aesthetic. There you go. Very nice. Did you enjoy yourself? Always, yeah. I was actually very, I remember now how um, uh, intimidated everyone was on campus when Octavia uh, came around. It's very different. And, right, and rightly so. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. There's also a funny thing that you, you make this, it's a kind of a gentle read in the opening of the book where you talk about, um, you know, what queer theorists would have said about um, the, uh, the East Village drag queen uh, scene, right? Um, so I actually uh, 
was I wrote my undergraduate thesis on <laughs> drag ball scene. Oh, uh, did you? Wow. I did. Yeah. I was the pulled it up here. Uh, I read the whole thing, of course. Art, history, and culture in New York City drag balls. Um, so that's what I was doing when you know I was up in Connecticut. Was gleaning what I could from what was happening in. Oh. Uh, Oh, but that's fantastic. Oh, my God. So you already had um, a knowledge by the time you got to New York, too, of like some of the major players. Although although I think you were focusing on kind of a different scene, actually, than when it was happening downtown in many ways. Well, like many people, it was, you know, of my generation, you know, uh, Paris is Burning kind of brought us. That was a thing that kind of, you know, Janet Livingston's film was the thing that it was our, our point of entry, I guess, you know, but yes. I had I had the like, the New York, the guide to New York City drag queens were that book, the Julian yes, by Julian book. Fleischer. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I was definitely on the, you know, I was definitely, you know, uh, very aware and interested in, in, in what was happening downtown as well. Mm-hmm. David, are you done with the slideshow right now? I think so, yeah. Can um, you make Can you make me the host again? Yeah, for sure. I think uh, if, you know, we have a couple minutes, we can take a few questions probably if, uh, if anyone has uh, anything burning that they'd like to say. Um, let me just switch this over back to Linda. My very first time hosting a, a Zoom call, Zoom meeting, I think it went pretty well, right? <laughs> yeah, but David, do you have to take down this slideshow? Oh yeah, here we go. Okay. Yes, thank you very much. Of course. Um, again, I think there were a few people that joined us late. Um, I, I'm the voice that was talking about the photos. And this is um, the famous drag queen. Um, what was your drag name again? <laughs> Tell me. Art? <laughs> what was your drag name? Octavia. Octavia, yes, of course. All right. And then David is the publisher and the art director of the magazine, of the book. David, did you want to um, do a Q&A, did you say? Yeah. If anyone has any uh, questions they want to ask or any uh, particular images that they want to see again, or uh, perhaps you want to ask how to order dozens of copies of the book. Um, <laughs> Well, if anyone has a question, they can chat it in right now. Um, or if you do, um, you uh, if you just want, if you want to speak, I can spotlight you too. And um, uh, just let me know on the chat or by putting that little hand up um, that um, indicates you want to talk. Um, I should also mention too that... Um, the, the David and I um, became familiar with each other because of uh, the publishers of my first book, Pages. And um, that's um, Sam and Elizabeth who put together um, a, a publishing company called Paradigm. So certainly they um, helped, um, you know, start everything also. So I want to give them a shout out. I'm dropping the uh, the website of the press into the chat right now. So if you're interested in ordering a copy of The Drag Explosion, you can go there. Uh, yeah, will you put up my website too, thedragexplosion.com? You got it. There, I have some information on there too. I mean, if you're interested. More images and more information at uh, thedragexplosion.com. Right. And and David, like David said, I do, this whole thing kind of like spawns too from a, from um, um, a slideshow presentation I do of my photos that tells like the history of that era. And um, and now this, you know, of course is the book version. Um, I just I have a question, just a quick one. I mean, it's, we didn't get a chance to see it in the slide, but I noticed that there were there were a lot of images of someone named Eric. Oh, um, uh, well, how interesting you would ask about a hunky, a hunky nearly undressed guy. That's basically the question. <laughs> um, it's not very, very Well, Eric um, was um, a friend of mine, I guess. And um, Eric, um, who's shown in the photos, um, was, um, mm, you know, he was of the streets. 
you know, I think had a tough life um, and um, was interested in rapping. Um, but, but I, but he was very, um, willing to pose. He liked posing and he was very good looking. And so I took some photos of him. He did, he enjoyed that. And, um, you know, he was very sexy too. So it was, um, I, I'm, I, I've lost touch with, um, Eric and, um, I hope that he's doing well wherever he is. Um, so, but, um, but at the time we were in each other's lives quite a bit. Is that too um, vague? No, that's <laughs> right. Um, well, we don't have a question, but we do have a comment that says the domain book website is so freaking cool. That's amazing. I get a lot of comments yeah. expressing the opposite. So, <laughs> but I think it's great. <laughs> I like it, but I think it's a little difficult to read sometimes. That's a, that's a, yeah, that's a popular sentiment also. <laughs> I think people get confused because of the background. <laughs> um, did we have someone that wants to speak? Okay, here, I'm going to unmute you, okay? And this one second, replace spotlight. If you say so, let's try saying something now. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, okay, cool. What's your name, um, please? Uh, Madison. Where are you calling from, Madison? Uh, Richmond, Virginia. Oh, fantastic. Yes. Um, she's a Southern Belle. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I had just, this, was been, this has been really great. And I, I love just seeing these photos and kind of going on this journey. Um, and I really also was drawn to the kind of conversation a little bit about cameras and um, David, you were talking about like this piece of like moving away from documentation. And I'm realizing like, and I just wanna wonder what you all think about this. Like now that we're all in sort of lockdown and my life has paused, I realized that over the last years of my being out and partying, I don't have any images because a lot of the places that I go are, you know, verboten, images are verboten, but I don't have anything to look at to kind of remember the moment. So I'm just wondering, you know, what you all might how you all think about that or think about this kind of moment of um, ephemera, ephemeral traces and like lack of something to look back on. Hmm. You know, it's, I think it's kind of a, I, I, I hear you. It's, it's like a two edged sword though with that camp, with bringing out the cameras because if you always have the camera with you you're not living the moment. I mean, we all know that, you know? So as sentimental as it is to look at the photos later, maybe it's better to have, you know, the sweet memories. And also, um, I, uh, that being said, I wish I had taken more photos. You know, I wish I had because my, I, my book, and I try to make this clear, is not the comprehensive um, end all and be all of that era. You know, there were a lot of things I didn't take photos of. There's a lot of people that probably should be included that were really important in that era. So, you know, it, it, it's tough though. Um, but Tommy, do you know what I mean? Like sometimes it's like, you know, you don't, the cameras replace like the immediacy of the experience now. Uh, totally. And, you know, I, I'm sort of in, you know, um, I, insofar as like I've continued to go out, like um, up until like the pandemic, you know, I have been, in a lot of these spaces that Madison is talking about where the whole point, you know, it's like you go out to like get away from cameras, right? And But, but then as a result, everything else, you know, I think people do things like they do a lot of documenting of their like their looks and things though, like before they go out though, you know? So like, if you did want to have like a memory of like what your outfit was or something, like you still have that, you know? Like I do think that the, you know, I mean, I definitely respect the places that, um, you know, they're like, yeah, like just put the camera aside. Um, I mean, not even just about photos, but it's also about, um, because all the, all the, you know, most of the photography is with cell phones. It's also about just taking a text message from like whatever, you know, it's like being present in partying and nightlife is actually not as like putting the straight world away, right? Long enough to be, you know, in this alternate uh, space and alternate experience. 
Well, that's part of the, yeah, with cameras too, I think people are a lot less, when cameras are around, a lot less prone to being um, spontaneous, maybe, about their naughty behavior, you know, which is kind of like a bummer, you know, yeah. because half the fun of going out is to be sort of, you know, I, yeah, I have to say it would be kind of, it's difficult for me to imagine doing like designing a book like this or publishing a book like this based on um, contemporary material. There is one, there's one, I do have an aspiration or ambition to publish a book um, of uh, images from this one venue in New York called The Spectrum that closed recently. Mm. I feel like would be really, I think that could be successful because there is imagery from both from and surrounding that venue. But it seems like most of the images that come out of nightlife these days happen um, in these adjacent spaces, right? Like it's people's looks when they're, when they're getting ready to go out or it's, you know, after, before, et cetera. Um, and then currently what's especially interesting, I think is that you get a lot of like nightlife is almost exclusively image based because it's happening in this interface that we're in right now. And I think it could be interesting potentially in the future, once we get a little bit of distance from this moment to be able to document how people sort of kept this culture going um, with this totally new platform. I mean, that's part of what I'm trying to do now with the press and through Linda's book is to be able to like crystallize and preserve this culture that's otherwise really based on sort of like being ephemeral and like letting loose and letting go and, and disappearing. Um, and to try to keep it alive to some degree while it's uh, in this weird um, in-between mm -hmm. state, so. And you know what? Part of the reason I think that the drag explosion looks good is because I shot the photos on film. And that is really says a lot. I mean, I, you know, I love digital, of course. Who doesn't? The convenience, et cetera. But, there's, but I really think that film looks better and- um, Very um, flattering very flattering and just richer. And so I think that in some ways, I'm not quite sure what my point is, but <laughs> but I just wanted to say the book is so good. No, um, but anyways, but Madison, thank you so much for your question. I hope that we touched upon something that you were speaking of. Very nice, thank you. Um, David, was there anybody else that wanted to say anything right now? I didn't see anyone okay. in the chat, um, but well, we've gone for about an hour. I think we can. I think we can call it at that. To be perfectly honest, it's really been a pleasure talking to you both and finally meeting you for the first time and getting together on in one space and and looking at these images because it's. Uh, I've spent a lot of time looking at them alone in front of a computer and, and putting this book together. So it's nice to be able to have uh, what I would typically like rely on as the, the book launch experience, but in this format. And thanks everyone else for, for joining as well. I'm really glad we got to, to, share this, um, to share this material with you. And I hope you'll buy a copy of the book and, and see the, the work that we did in, in real life because it's very special. Tavia, would you like to give a review of the book? <laughs> um, I, um, I, uh, other than um, thanking you for reminding me how old I am, <laughs> it's like, wow, um, it's, um, it's, it's, it's a, it's a real, um, you know, for people who remember this period, but were, for people for whom this is their careless youth, you know, like, thank you for documenting it because I, didn't you know what I'm saying like and so it's an opportunity to just remember especially at this moment um and then for people who um for whom this is some ancient history <laughs> right? BC as you, I think either you or Lady Bunny says before the camera before cell phones um it's just like an invitation to to like imagine all that can be um uh all that can grow up from the from the ashes, right? I feel like queer culture is always like burning down and then like being rebuilt up from the ashes, right? I think that's like so much of the spirit of uh, the East Village um, represented, um, and that the book is uh, reminding us can ha can and, and should happen again in the future. Yeah, I think that's a good point. 
I think that, you know, it's silly to act like we're anything's going to be repeated exactly, you know, because things have changed. I think when people long for the good old days, I understand it, but it's never going to come back, you know, as was. So it's better to, like you said, like, you know, um, have something emerge from the ashes. Phoenix from the ashes. <laughs> there you go. David, would you like to do a shout out to your guests and then maybe we should wrap it up? Um, shout out to my guests. Thanks everyone for coming. <laughs> Love you guys. Really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, it's just been, it's been great to talk to you both. So thank you. Thank you for agreeing to do this. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Javier, a lot. You. I love your essay. Thank you, Linda. I love your photos. Thank you so much. Take care, this, everyone. The Zoom is ending in 10 seconds, everybody. <laughs> 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Bye. <laughs>